doubt the prophets. What have we foretold that has not come to pass? There are those who said this day would never come. What are they to say now? Based on all of this. And there's, there's nothing wrong with, with saying that, Brad. You know, I mean, having, the, having a correct... If the people of Georgia are angry. And these numbers are going to be repeated on Monday night, along with others that we're going to have by that time, which are much more substantial even. And the people of Georgia are angry. The people of the country are angry. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Now, do you think it's possible that they uh, shredded ballots in uh, Fulton County? Because that's what the rumor is. And also that Dominion took out machines. Uh, that Dominion is really moving fast to get rid of their uh, machinery. Do you know anything about that? Because that's illegal. No, Ryan Germany. No, Dominion is not. Um, moved any machinery out of Fulton County? We're having well, but no, but, but have they moved? Uh, have they have they moved the inner parts of the machines and replaced them with other parts? No. You sure, Ryan? I'm sure. You should want to have an accurate election, and you're a Republican. We believe, but we do have an accurate election. No, I no, you don't. No, no, you know, you don't have, you don't have, not even close. You got, you're off by hundreds of thousands of votes. You know what they did and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and, you know, you can't let that happen. That's, that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer. That's a big risk. But they are shredding ballots, in my opinion, based on what I've heard. And they are removing machinery. Uh, and they're moving it as fast as they can, both of which are criminal fines, and you can't let it happen, and you are letting it happen. Oh, you know, I mean, I'm notifying you that you're letting it happen. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. So, so tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? We won the election, and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's going to be very costly in many ways. And I think you have to say that you're going to reexamine it, and you can reexamine it, but, but reexamine it with people that want to find answers, not people that don't want to find answers. Uh, for instance, I'm hearing Ryan, and he's probably – I'm sure a great lawyer and everything, but he's making statements about those ballots that he doesn't know. But he's making them with such he, – he did make them with surety, but now I think he's less sure because the answer is they all went to Biden. And that alone wins us the election by a lot. You know, so. Mr. President, uh, you have people that submit information, and we have our people that submit information – and then it comes before the court, and the court then has to make a determination. We have to stand by our numbers. We believe our numbers are right. Well, under law, you're not allowed to give faulty election results, okay? You're not allowed to do that, and that's what you've done. This is a faulty election result. And honestly, this should go very fast. You should meet tomorrow because you have a big election election coming up. And because of what you've done to the president, you know, the people of, of uh, Georgia know that this was a scam. And because of what you've done to the president, a lot of people aren't going out to vote. And a lot of Republicans are going to vote negative because they hate what you did to the president. OK, they hate it. And they're going to vote. And if you would be respected, if really respected, if this thing could be straightened out before the election. You have a big election coming up on Tuesday. I don't really have to work hard to tell anyone with um, an IQ higher than five what exactly was wrong in that phone conversation that you just witnessed. But what I will simply say is that it is obvious that what is happening here is election fraud 
on the part of the current and soon-to-be former president, Donald J. Trump. Um, and obviously, he is attempting to use the powers of the office to intimidate and to threaten other members of other offices with their positions. So basically, to make a long story short, originally I wasn't even going to keep talking about this because I, I made a thread about the election 2020, and I assumed it would have been over by now. Now, I already knew years ago that he was never going to be a two-term president, but I never imagined that my thread would continue this long. Like, I thought by now it would have been completely over and, like, he would have lost by so much that it would have been completely obvious that it was completely over. This guy is like a case of um, food poisoning. It's like he just refuses to go away. And I was trying to figure out, so what exactly is happening here? Because as you know, I'm going to be watching from the warmth of my home with my 80-inch television. I'm going to be watching the uh, right-winger march on Washington on January 6th. Basically, I'm just watching it because I know something bad's going to happen. So basically, you know, I'm going to be watching it and I'm going to be ready to record anything bad that happens. Because I already know something bad's going to happen. I just don't know what. But um, I wondered, like, what is the end game here? And I realized that by Trump trying to call the election, see, not you got to understand, he's not only trying to call the presidential election a fraud, he's also trying to invalidate all of the other elections based on the presidential election because he's basically trying to say the entire thing is fraudulent. Now, that's left uh, the Georgia um, run between Kelly Loeffler and her opponent because Kelly Loeffler, as you know, she's the Republican running uh, against a uh, Democrat uh, there. And the thing about it is Trump is really doing serious damage because the longer he continues this, a lot of people are turning on the Republican Party because, for, ex for instance, Mitch McConnell is one of the uh, Republicans who's going to certify the election for Biden. Now, there are a couple of holdouts. I think there's like 12 of them. But the thing about it is you can't go against Mitch McConnell and still be in that party. I mean, that's like just ridiculous. And Mitch McConnell, a lot of people hate him right now. So it appeared to me that Trump was trying to you know, make people angry at Mitch McConnell by saying, oh, well, he's not passing bigger welfare checks for y'all, so y'all should, you know, go to his house and vandalize it and this, that, and other. And obviously they hate Nancy Pelosi, who, by the way, just re-won uh, her speakership position. And they came to her house and they put like a pig's head there and put uh, fake blood or something like that. But um, what Trump is doing is he's literally trying to tear down the Republican Party. First of all, Electoral college is already met. Biden has his over 300 electoral votes. So this isn't even close. It's not even like it's 270 versus something else. No, it's not even close. 300 plus to Trump's whatever, it's just less. I don't even need to state the number because it doesn't really matter. It's like it's like when you win a game, you win by having more points than the opponent. That's just it. So the bottom line is, what he's doing now is literally trying to pit people against each other and against the party itself by continuing these ridiculous assertions. I'll call them assertions. I got that word from Bill Clinton. But he's continuing these ridiculous assertions that the election's fraudulent and that Dominion stealing machines. And meanwhile, you got the Secretary of State telling you, no, that's not true. Your, your, your information is flawed. And it's sad because as much as I keep trying to not look at this and I keep trying to ignore this, the problem is Trump is like the gift that keeps on giving. He just keeps going and going and going like a goddamn Energizer Bunny, you know, with a bad hairpiece. It's just ridiculous. But the bottom line is the Electoral College has already met. Congress is about to certify those votes, which is part of the reason why I absolutely believe Trump signed that um, horrible bill recently, because if the government had shut down, all these people would have showed up on January 6th, and there would have been nobody to show up there to yell at, because the government would have been closed. So my guess is he signed it, even though he knew that the welfare checks that were included were small, and despite the fact all these right-wing talk people were yelling about democracy programs in Venezuela and uh, gender studies in Pakistan, and they're talking about all the pork in the bill. That's absolutely ridiculous. 
The simple fact is Trump signed it to keep the government going. So that tells me that either he doesn't, A, believe in what he's claiming that he fights in, or he was trying to keep the government open just to make it so that when these people show up, they have somebody to shout out. So that's what I think. But uh, bottom line is, I don't even have to really continue on this. Trump may have committed a crime by placing this phone call. And the, the last thing I got to say is, who does he have around him? Like, are there Secret Service agents or is there anybody who's like, listen, like who like I'm at, if I'm if I get on the phone and let's say I try to make a prank call to the FBI. Usually, if there was somebody there, they're gonna say, "What are you doing? You can't do that. Stop. What are you? You're gonna get us all pinched or something." Like, who's around him telling this guy that what you're doing is not only stupid but it's illegal? Like, I'm trying to understand. Like, that there's nobody. Is there nobody there to tell him like that he's he's committing a crime? So my thing is, you know, I, I don't know what exactly uh, Biden's uh, White House is going to look like, but I know it's going to be a hell of a lot better than this one. And maybe it's because people are so afraid of Trump threatening them, just like he did in this video music clip that I just posted. Maybe they're afraid of him threatening their jobs and their livelihood. So they're just letting him run amok and do whatever he wants. I have to guess that that's what it is. Because you'd think that somebody would tell him, it's like, yo, idiot, get off the phone, get off the Twitter, stop it. But there's just, it just seems like there's nobody to do it. So basically like this, I'm embarrassed for the country. I'm embarrassed for the White House. We are embarrassed for the world. January 6th is going to come and go. January 20th is going to come and go. Come high noon, Trump's gone. And that's just it. Like, you could complain, oh, Dominion and the Venezuelans and Chavez came back from the grave to steal the election. Y'all can go on and on and on and on about that stupid That's the lady shit. from Ohio. All you want. But at the end of the day, it's like, to address the House it, it just, minutes at this point, it doesn't extraneous matter. material in the record. Without objection, so granted. Mr. Speaker, here's the latest reality game. Let's play Wall Street bailout. Rule one. Rush the decision. Time the game to fall in the week before Congress is set to adjourn and just six weeks before an historic election so your opponents will be preoccupied, pressured, distracted, and in a hurry. Rule two, disarm the public through fear. Warn that the entire global financial system will collapse and the world will fall into another Great Depression. Control the media enough to ensure that the public will not notice that this bailout will indebt them for generations, taking them from trillions of dollars, taking from them trillions of dollars they earned and deserve to keep. Rule three, control the playing field and set the rules. Hide from the public and most of the Congress just who is arranging this deal. Communicate with the public through leaks to media insiders. Limit any open congressional hearings. Communicate with Congress via private teleconferencing calls. Heighten political anxiety by contacting each political party separately. Treat members of Congress condescendingly, telling them that the matter is so complex that they must rely on those few insiders who really do know what's going on. Rule four, divert attention and keep people confused. Manage the news cycle so Congress and the public have no time to examine who destroyed the prudent banking system that served America so well for 60 years after the financial meltdown of the 1920s. Rule five, always keep in mind the goal is to privatize gains to a few and socialize losses to the many. For 30 years in our in one financial scandal after another, Wall Street game masters have kept billions of dollars of their gains and shifted their losses to American taxpayers. Once this bailout is in place, the greed game will begin again. But I have a counter game. It's called Wall Street Reckoning. Congress shouldn't go home to campaign. It should put America's accounts in order. To Wall Street insiders, it says no on behalf of the American people. You have perpetrated the greatest financial crimes ever on this American republic.
You think you can get by with it because you are extraordinarily wealthy and the largest contributors to both presidential and congressional campaigns in both major parties. But you are about to be brought under firm control. First, America doesn't need to bail you out. It needs to secure the real assets and property, not your paper. That means the homes and properties of hardworking Americans who are about to lose their homes because of your mortgage greed. There should be a new job for regional Federal Reserve banks. We want no home foreclosed if a serious workout agreement can be put into place. And if you don't do it, we want a notarized statement by a Federal Reserve official that they tried and failed. Second. Taxpayers should directly gain any equity benefits that may flow from this historic bailout. We want the American people to get first priority in taking ownership of the institutions that want to pass their toxic paper on to the taxpayers. Third, before any bailouts for Wall Street, America needs major job creation to rebuild our national infrastructure. America needs assets, not paper. We need working assets. Fourth, the time for real financial regulatory change is now, not next year. A modernized Glass-Steagall Act must be put in place. We need to reestablish locally owned community savings banks across this country and create within the Justice Department a fully funded unit to prosecute every single high-flying thief whose fraud and criminal acts created this debacle and then force their disgorgement of assets going back 15 years. Fifth, any refinancing must return a major share of profits to a new Social Security and Medicare lockbox where the monies can go to pay for a dignified and assured retirement for every American. This member isn't voting for a penny of it. Those who created and profited from this game of games must be brought to justice. The assets they stole must be returned to the American taxpayers right down to the tires on their Mercedes. Mr. Speaker, I ask my colleagues to join me in co-sponsoring my bill to create an independent commission to investigate these well-heeled wrongdoers. Real reform now or nothing. Mr. Speaker, I yield back my remaining time. Gentleman from Indiana, for what purpose does he rise? Mr. Speaker, I rise. This were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dictator. 